Well, good evening and welcome back to Shenandoah Baptist Church here on Wednesday night. We are studying through the book of 2 Timothy and once more, I'm glad to have you with us if this is your first time joining us at Shenandoah Baptist Church as we go through our Bible study. Welcome and I'm glad you're here and I hope that very soon we're all able to come back together and meet together once more here in the building. We are in the book of 2 Timothy, so if you can, if you have a Bible, please go ahead and open it to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2 tonight, we'll finally be able to clinch this chapter, finish it up, and uh, we'll move on to chapter number 3 next week. I hope you've been enjoying our Bible studies as we go through these, and they may not always be uh, wildly exciting, but it's still nice to, uh, to get out a shovel and to dig in deep when it concerns the things the Lord has to say to, uh, to Timothy uh, through the heart of Paul uh, and to the rest of us as well. Chapter number two is dealing much with uh, a good soldier and how he is to behave. And again, this letter is written from a mentor to the heart of a young person that he is trying to teach and, and mold. And now he's trying to get him to uh, stand up and fill in the gap that Paul is about to leave behind because he's about to be killed. Uh, he's about to be martyred and Timothy needs to step up. But there are many things in which Timothy needs to be warned about in the process. One of these things, uh, some of these things are what we're going to be dealing with tonight. If you don't recall, last Wednesday night, we went over these verses, but in a great house are many vessels. There's vessels of honor, there's vessels of dishonor, vessels that we respect highly and vessels that we use for uh, less respectable things. And he's encouraging Timothy to keep his vessel, that his vessel is to be filled. I've heard many times, maybe one of the reasons why um, when we lift up our cup to be filled by the Lord and He doesn't fill it, maybe one of the reasons why is because it's already filled with things that we've already put into our lives, influences we've decided, philosophies we've decided. And we've held up an already filled cup and said, fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. And it's already filled. He says, Timothy, you need to be a vessel meet for the Master's use and prepared unto every good work. Continuing this thought, we get to verse number 22 where it says, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. We get back to verse number two. Flee also youthful lusts. When we deal with this word lust, typically what comes to our mind are the fleshly lusts and desires that a young person would have as uh, they come into their body and as they uh, change and learn and have these new desires uh, that they don't quite know how to contain or, or channel or handle yet. But that's not all of what this verse is talking about. Maybe that might be what initially comes to our mind but there are many lusts that are going to be associated with a young person. And um, these youthful lusts are referring to every sort of strong tendency that a young person might have. Sometimes a business doesn't want to hire a young person because of some of these tendencies. And, and by all means, when a church is calling a pastor, one must be aware. You're, you're looking for a pastor who is, as Scripture says, not a novice. Not somebody who is brand spanking new to this. And not to say that God can never use somebody who's new to the scene. Not to say that God can't use a novice. But when choosing a pastor for a church, you must be wise and you must be careful because that novice is going to have several pools on them from external sources, plus also pools from within the church, deacons, teachers, other people, uh, maybe that they respect that are pooling on them. And a novice may not be able to 
withstand all of those external pulls. These youthful lusts are referring to a variety of things, and I think one of the best ways for us to understand quite what Paul is talking about with these useful lusts is in the next phrase. We see the opposite. It says, but follow. Okay, so first of all, there are things which you must flee. There are things which you must actively fight or uh, fly would be another good synonym here for this, to fly from them. If you're going to run from these things, in the next phrase, here are things you're to run to. So if I'm to run to righteousness, it says, but follow righteousness, then one of these youthful lusts is going to be unrighteousness. And of course, immorality falls in that unrighteous category. But there are many things that young people are drawn to, that are pulled to, that are natural tendencies apart from just immorality. Next is faith. Follow faith, which means if I'm to run to faith, I'm to flee doubt. I'm to run to a faith, not just a faith in religion, not just a faith in myself and my own abilities, but a faith in God and His creation and His providence and looking over and, and watching over me. I'm to run towards faith in His salvation and His ability to save me and to keep me eternally saved. I'm to flee doubt and to run to faith. Charity being next. Charity. Partially, you know, I'm kind of partial to the word charity because, well, as you know, or some of you know, I have a seven-month-old. She just turned seven months. A seven-month-old named Charity. Charity means love. And it's not an Eros kind of love. It's the kind of love that as Christians we ought to have for one another, but also the same kind of love that goes outside these doors too. Charity. In our modern use of the term charity, it simply uh, me, it means to, to give to those who do not have, to take care of someone who cannot take care of themselves, to give money to charity is to help those who are unable to help themselves, or in some cases won't help themselves, but um, here in charity is, is meaning love, the kind of love that you have for other people within your church. Maybe it's folks who aren't able to help themselves in an encouragement sense. People who need encouraged, people who need helped, people who need you to pray with them or pray for them. Also, folks in the church who need a ride, folks in the church who need a helping hand to show charity. But if I'm to follow after charity, that means I'm to flee away from selfishness, pride, to care more for others and their needs than I care for myself and mine. To think less of myself and more of others. This is the idea of charity. It is the opposite of selfishness. And I tell you what, selfishness is certainly a mark of immaturity. This is another youthful lust. It's in, it inborn. I certainly did not have to teach my children to be selfish. I didn't have to teach them uh, to reach out and grab something from their sibling and say, mine. I didn't have to teach them to push them away in anger because they took a toy. No, that is natural. And it takes years of teaching and training for parents to teach children to have charity. Charity means, no, I don't need to have the first bite of the banana. Charity means, no, I don't have to have the biggest piece of the cookie or the biggest, nicest piece of the cake. I don't have to have the best. Charity means, in my family's sense, for my children, that I can share and I can accept less, that I can share and not expect something back in return, that I'm simply to be kind and nice to my siblings. Charity is the opposite of what youthful lust is going to be. If I'm to follow after charity, I'm to flee away from selfishness. The last one here is peace. Follow after peace. And this particular section is going to be spoken of a little bit more as we continue on. To follow after peace means that I am to leave strife. As it says in the very next verse, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. In verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, 
but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, and it goes on. You might say to yourself, but wait a minute, isn't the Christian supposed to be in the fight? Well, yes, in the fight against the gates of hell, in the fight against wickedness and evil, but not against the person. Remember, we don't hate the person. We simply hate the sin, the deceit that they've gotten themselves involved in or that they've allowed. That's why we as Christians are to be, as I've said before, stretcher bearers and not tail bearers. To, to, to bring them to the great physician so they can be healed, even if they stepped on a landmine, even if they made a foolish mistake, nonetheless, rather than being tail bearers, were to be stretcher bearers. To flee youthful lust and to follow after peace means I need to leave strifes behind. It's natural for a young man to want to fight, to want to race, to want to compete, to always want to have their dander up and ready to get involved in something. And that's, that's somewhat natural. Some of us are more passive uh, than others. I, I was certainly one of those more passive type of person. That's my personality. I don't, I don't enjoy striving and fighting. I don't even enjoy competing all that much. But as a Christian, we're not to be striving against the government. We're not to be striving against the wickedness. I'm sorry, the wicked people. To be striving against the drunkard. To be striving against the person who is hooked on drugs. To be striving against the person who, who continues to go back to their boyfriend or their husband, even though they get beaten, even though uh, you know, things are happening to them. And We're not to, to fight against them. We're not to tear them down. We're instead... I guess we can move on, like it says in verse 24, we're to be gentle unto all men. You know, there will be people that will come into the church that may believe and try to teach false doctrine. Hey, you know what? There is a time to rebuke that. There's a time to stand up and put up a wall for your congregation and say that that's not going to happen here. However, just because somebody does not agree with my doctrine doesn't necessarily mean that they're trying to rebel against me. And there may be, and probably is, an opportunity for me to be able to teach them appropriately and to change their minds. As I've mentioned many times before, in the church I came from in South Florida, there were many people that were coming to that church that we characterized under a specific name, and I'm not going to give a name here about that, but they were characterized under a specific teacher from the internet, and they all had very similar beliefs, uh, you know, because they followed after that person. Well, you could have, we could have either, as soon as we realized, you know, that they were followers of this person online, uh, could have just waved them off, sent them back in and, and told them, you know, go find another church to corrupt somewhere. But we also could have gone the other route, been aware of the dangers that they pose, but also try to, be, to teach them. Because in some cases, they have never heard anything different. They had never heard what, you know, independent Baptists teach from the Bible. And so in some cases, they would get mad and leave, and in other cases, they would stick around and be teachable and learn and grow and change. It's all about being aware, one, of the danger they pose, but two, caring for their soul, caring for their eternity, caring for uh, the souls of their, their spouses and of their children and of other people that they're going to come into contact with and attempting as, as best as possible to be gentle, apt to teach, patience. We'll come to all that here in just a little bit. I want to look over to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Go ahead and hold your finger here. And we'll turn back to chapter number 6. <clears throat> and I want to look at, I believe it's verse number 11. It's a very similar verse. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after. And here we have another list of things you're supposed to flee from and towards. Righteousness, godliness, faith. Love, patience, and meekness. Now, the list of things that we are to flee from, that would have been in previous verses. And you can go back and reread the beginning of chapter number 6 to find out what things Paul is encouraging Timothy to, to fly away from, to run away from. By the way, running away from something is not a sign of cowardice. We know that 
courage is simply remaining, being consistent and faithful to your duty in the midst of fear and in the midst of terror. This is courage. It's simply doing what you know you're supposed to do, even though you're scared to death to do it. And it's not a lack of courage for Timothy to flee from these youthful lusts. There certainly is a time to run. There certainly is a time to cut and get out of there. In 3 John, verse number 9, we read about diatrophies. And, and this is going back here to youthful lusts. Uh, one of the things that I think um, young people often have this tendency to fall into is loving preeminence. In other words, loving the limelight, getting the attention, being with and known by well-known famous people. And that's something that young pastors need to avoid, as well as old pastors too. But we need to avoid the desire for the limelight, the desire for preeminence, diatrophies. It said in 3 John 9, he loved to have the preeminence. And I think this is also something that Timothy was being warned against. Verse number 23, it says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. These foolish and unlearned questions. We could also say that these are undisciplined or um, unchastened inquiries. That's the way somebody else um, put this to kind of give us a better understanding of what is being spoken about here. Foolish and unlearned questions. What kind of questions are these? We've all been asked these kinds of questions before. I remember one time when I was knocking doors, and I think it was in Pensacola while I was in college, somebody said, okay, fine, you know what? I'll let you talk, um, and uh, you know, basically, I'll give credence to what you're saying if you can answer this one question for me. So we go, well, okay. Um, and he says, where did Cain get his wife? And of course here, the trap was meant to be, well, they're going to have to say that he married a sister, and of course, that's illegal, and that's wrong, it's immoral. Uh, so how can then we uh, believe the rest of what the Bible has to say? Well, of course, he did have to marry a very close family member, probably a sister. Um, but back then, it wasn't against the biblical law that hadn't come until many, 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 many centuries later. And of course, it wasn't against the law in America because America didn't even exist. So yeah, they were trying to catch, he was trying to catch us up in some words. And the moral of the fact, the, the, the moral of the matter here is this. He didn't really actually care what we had to say. He was just raising questions to no avail. And it didn't matter if we gave a perfect answer to his question. He didn't want to hear what we had to say anyways. He more or less wanted to throw us off our foundation. He wanted to uh, <clears throat> throw us off kilter so that we didn't have the advantage in this um, confrontation at his door, so to speak. These are people who ask foolish and unlearned questions. Usually what they're trying to do is they're trying to dig out secrets of God that can only be found through the the leading of the Holy Spirit, through revelation, and they're trying to figure it out by inquiry. And many of these questions cannot be determined that way. You can't go into... um, the house of God or, or talk to somebody at their door and, and, and answer a question like, if God is almighty and if God is all powerful, then why didn't he kill the devil? Why didn't he, you know, wring Satan's neck when he went into that serpent? How do you answer that question? If God is all knowing, then why did he create Adam and Eve to have um, a, a desire to sin? How do you answer a question like that? These kinds of answers only come about through revelation and God's word, not by inquiry. Or the questions like, well, if God is so loving, how come he allows children to die of this disease? Well, if God is so loving, how come there are people all around the world um, starving to death right now if God is so loving? These people, 2 Peter 3.5 describes them as being willingly ignorant. The fact is, they've already made up their mind about what they believe, and they're just gendering strifes. They're just raising questions with no answers to them. Their heart is unregenerated, and unrepentantly so. They wish to stay that way. They are not sincere truth seekers. Now, people who ask those kinds of questions, that's not to say that there is not a slight opportunity that you can still witness to them 
and that the gospel being the power of God into salvation can still break that stone that is in their heart, can still penetrate their defenses. And so it might be a good opportunity still for us to share the gospel with them. However, I don't want to waste a lot of time with them either. Because as we read about previously, questions like that are only going to subvert the hearers. Verse number 24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive. This is not to say that a pastor, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, a Bible college student, a layman is not to to strive against the gates of hell because as Scripture tells us, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. That's not to say that we are not to strive against wickedness in all of its forms. That's not to say that in the pulpit that the man of God is not to burn and, and, and uh, to shine a great light that is going to strive against sin in the congregation. That's not to say that the pastor should not uh, speak with the husband and wife and help them to deal with their situation and to work hard at it. This is striving against people is what it is talking about fighting against them, having this this mindset of actively working and fighting against people. Hey, you know, there's time for our dander to get up about something. And of course, as is on a lot of people's minds right now, we, we weigh overstepping of government, whether federal, state, or local, with our rights and freedoms as United States citizens. We weigh that also with the fact that we are Christians and We're just pilgrims in this world anyways. How far do we need to step into matters or should we really just allow ourselves to be more focused on the gospel and the church? And we try to weigh all of these things together and determine what it is we ought to do. The Bible is teaching us that the servant of the Lord, now he is speaking to Pastor Timothy here, a young man, but this applies to everybody Just the same. Every Christian, just the same. The servant, if you wish to be a servant of the Lord, you must not strive. You must not be constantly arguing and fighting. You must not be constantly seeking to place your thoughts and opinions and to win arguments, even if it is a theological argument. Sometimes we can spend 30, 45 minutes or longer getting involved in a theological argument where our only purpose is to test our abilities or to attempt to come out on top But what's really happening is we're losing our witness and our testimony in the process. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle. And again, if we're unsure what strive means in this sense, we look at the converse. If you're to avoid this, then what is it that you are to run to? Gentleness. I heard a story, and I've probably told this story before, of someone that went into a church <clears throat> who, did, who didn't believe that you could keep your salvation, who, who had been taught somewhere along the line that you could lose your salvation. And the preacher, when they spoke to the preacher about this, immediately uh, turned the cold shoulder to them and said, well, you can take that, fa- that heresy elsewhere. We don't want any of that stuff here. And so they did. They took that heresy elsewhere. Note, they weren't talking to people within the church. They were asking the pastor about it. So they went to another church in the area and <clears throat> asked the pastor the same thing. And he met with them in his office, showed them about the fact that they could not lose their salvation, showed them from Scripture about eternal security. They changed their minds, joined the church, and been there ever since. Both pastors believed this, the, the right thing, believed in eternal security, One pastor sought to strive and fight against the people he disagreed with, and one dealt patiently. One dealt gently. Part of being gentle here is to be patient. First, I guess let's talk about apt to teach. Apt to teach. I'll tell you one thing I learned as a teacher over 10 years is that I have to put myself in my student's shoes to understand where they're coming from. Because I can stand up at the blackboard, the chalkboard, and I still like chalkboards. I can stand up the chalkboard, I can show you how to solve ratios, how to do long division, uh, how to diagram sentences, and I can show you those things. And then my student could sit there in the desk, wide-eyed, 
completely and utterly lost, even though I walked them through every single step. And it can be very frustrating as a teacher to finish the whole um, exercise problem on the board, to turn around and a hand goes up and says, uh, can you show us how to do number one? <laughs> whoa, whoa. I, just, I just went through that. And it can be very frustrating, and as a teacher, you can get tempted to kind of lash out at your students for not paying attention or for thinking a little bit harder this time or figure it out on your own, ply yourself. Or, as a teacher, what we ought to do is to put ourselves in their shoes. I remember very clearly sitting in Greek class and being utterly lost. As the teacher and the class moved forward, I was still swirling around in doubt and uncertainty way back here somewhere, and the further they got far away from me, the harder it was for me to catch up. That's not to take, of course, any of the, um, the blame off of myself for not putting in extra work and not trying harder or paying attention. There certainly does rest some blame there. But to be apt to teach means I have to understand where my my, my congregation is in a spiritual sense, in, a, in their doctrine and what they understand about Scripture, and that I am to help lead them along, not from where they should be, not from where I think they ought to be. Well, you've been saved for you know, 30 years. You should know this already. We're moving on. No, not to take them from where I think they ought to be, but from where they are spiritually and from where they are knowledge-wise in Scripture, not to shame them for what they don't know. And I caught myself doing that as a teacher at times. What? You're in eighth grade and you can't read? What's wrong with you, child? Uh, you certainly must be lazy then. And it can be easy to shame a student, even if it is legitimately their fault. To be apt to teach is to understand where they are and then to take them by the hand and lead them to where it is they ought to be. To lead them into the knowledge that they need to know. That's what teaching is. Being apt to teach and then being patient. Being patient. Understanding that, yes, maybe they ought to know this, but they don't. Maybe they should have listened, but they didn't. They should have been reading the Bible, but they haven't. They should have been praying, but they haven't. Well, they should have joined the church. They should have gotten baptized. They should have, should have, should have, but haven't. To be patient. Wow, you know, you're coming into my church and, you're, and, and you believe that? I can't believe you would believe that. But then, be patient. That might be the only thing they've ever heard. Maybe they are willing and open to hearing something else, different. If I have the patience to teach them and bring them along. Be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach, patient. In verse 25 it says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Why does it include that? In meekness. Again, meek is strength under control. It is easy as a teacher to show off your knowledge. And it was very easy as a teacher for me to get up there at the chalkboard and, and to just whiz right through math problems, whiz right through English stuff. Uh, and I love lists, and so I would make lists of all the different types of pronouns. We would have the preposition lists and songs, and boy, I could just poo 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 right through all of those lists. And it'll be easier for, as a teacher for me to just go up there, write it all on the board, whiz right through it, and impress my students with my great knowledge. And, when, and then at the end of the class, they're still sitting there with no knowledge. All I've done is impress them. But <clears throat> meekness as a teacher is not me trying to show off for my class. Meekness as a pastor is not me trying to show off for my congregation, my, my great scriptural knowledge, all the verses that I've memorized, the great doctrinal words that I can pronounce for you. And meekness is me going to where they are and teaching them, taking them by the hand, but also understanding that I'm not going to blame them for the situation that they are in. Understanding that I could very easily be in that exact same situation in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. We know <clears throat> that someone who refuses to accept the gospel, they are opposing themselves. They may not agree with you on that. They may not even understand that. But somebody who is refusing the gospel 
They are opposing. They are against themselves. Now, we can all think of somebody in our lives, maybe a cousin or a child, somebody who has involved themselves in some addictive um, substance, maybe alcohol, maybe drugs. Maybe it's people that they have gotten themselves involved in. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's music. And we see that person destroying themselves. We see that person diminish and become something else that is only half of what their potential was. We see them destroy themselves. And as a teacher, as a youth pastor, I saw this happen. I saw great potential wasted. I saw them destroy themselves. There was very little I could do from the outside. It seemed they were their own worst enemy. And they were literally opposing themselves. And they didn't see it that way. They didn't understand that. Now, it would be easy for me to stand there from the outside and to look down at them and say, Hi, you're just going to destroy yourself and you deserve it. Boy, if you go out there and get, you know, get drunk one more time, I hope you get into an accident. And it'd be easy for us to point our finger down at people that oppose themselves. But that's not what as Christians we're supposed to do. If you have a child, a cousin, if you have a friend who seems to be their own worst enemy, and they seem to make those same mistakes over and over again, the same mistakes that have deposed them in the past, your best choice, your best option as a parent, as a friend, is to pray for them. The first and most important thing that you can do is to pray for them. One thing, you're seeking the face of God. The second thing is you are creating within you the right attitude towards them. An attitude of this person needs help and I am going to be a part of helping them. Rather than, well, I mean, that person, they're just going to go out there and lose it for themselves. They're just going to go out there and destroy themselves, whatever. Let them do it. Having the right attitude. In meekness, instructing them that oppose themselves. Sharing the gospel with somebody, as I mentioned before, is a way in which we can instruct someone that opposes themselves. There may be, in, there may be times when an atheist lifts up their voice and decries what it is you are, you're preaching when you preach the gospel. Rather than getting angry with them, rather than yelling at them, rather than uh, uh, being unkind, be patient. Now, I'll tell you what, there is certainly times when a Christian needs to speak up and needs to very strongly decry the truth and very strongly oppose wickedness. There's certainly a time for that. We're not all to be wish-washy, weak-kneed Christians that allow anything and everything to overflow us. Sometimes people are going to see this patient, meek Christian as a compromiser. But that's not what we really are all the time. The Bible says that we are not to cast our pearls before swine. That we're not to give that which is holy unto dogs. But we're not really to argue, debate, or strive with those that ask foolish or ignorant questions. God's man, the servant of God, must be gentle to all men, even to the enemies of the gospel. It's not to say that we don't speak up when the time is necessary. But when we do speak up, hey, there is no name calling. When we do speak up, hey, we don't say things that we're going to regret later. We don't, we don't use words or language that others are going to be able to grab onto later and say, well, yeah, he's a Christian, but listen to what he said. He's no better than the rest of us. Well, that Christian lost his temper. He's no better than the rest of us. What's his Holy Spirit doing for him? What's his Savior doing for him? In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And it may be that somebody who is very actively vocal against the word of God, against God, if we are patient and if we are gentle and meek in our instruction, the opposition which they are bringing against us may weaken, may falter and fail altogether. And God may bring repentance into their hearts. That's what we ought to work for and that's what we ought to pray for. In verse number 26, 
the last verse of the chapter here is going to help us to see these people, the ones who are in dire spiritual trouble, to see them not as the aggressor, but as the prey that needs help. It says, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. You know what? That person might be a bar owner. That person, they may have several prostitutes that they send out into the streets every single night. And they may be quite upset with you for going out door knocking in their neighborhood, for soul winning in their area, for going after some of their patrons and trying to win them to the Lord. It may bother them greatly and they may come after you. But we have to recall that that person is in the snare of the devil. And we have light and truth that that person needs. They're not our enemy. It may seem that a man sitting in a position of power and government in our county or city in our state, it may seem that a man or a woman in sitting in one of those positions of power may be against the church, but they are not our enemy. They need to hear the light of the gospel. They need to hear the truth. And we have to be very careful that what we do and say does not diminish our testimony and our ability to share the gospel to them or to our community. And I think that's more so what I concern myself with. When considering whether or not we ought to close the doors of the church for this uh, virus, one of my considerations is we are right here on this main road on Route 11. If we choose to continue operating as normal, yes, we'll be putting our own members at risk, but we'll be putting our community at risk as well. Some people may not come to the services, but others may, even if they don't want to, just because the doors are open. And how's the community going to feel about that? You say, well, why should you care what the community thinks? Because very soon I might be witnessing to them. Very soon they might see a video on Facebook or YouTube from Shenandoah Baptist Church and so, yes, I do care what the community thinks about my charity towards them, about my love towards them. When I look at them, I need to see a bird in the net, a fish in the net. I need to see them in the snare, not hate them and not view them as my enemy. I need to view them in the snare of the devil. It says, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. I've heard, read that some people say here this last phrase, who are taken captive by him at his will. Him is referring to God. And this captivity is when God rescues them out of the snare of the devil. Um, and it is by the will of God that this happens. And uh, I don't know exactly what this last phrase of chapter 26 means. I know pastors don't say they don't know what it means, do they? Um, but I don't know everything, and I, I'm not exactly sure what this last phrase here is referring to, but the, obviously the point here of verse number 26 is the recovery of the lost, is the finding of that lost sheep or of that lost coin, like the parables that Jesus has given to recover them. And that ought to be our job as Christians. That ought to be our focus as Christians. Yes, there's a time to stand up and fight. But when it comes to lost people, we don't fight against them. We fight for them. They may not see it that way. But God does, and ultimately He's the one that rewards, isn't He? So Timothy, Paul is saying, be careful not to set yourself aside. Remember that you are a vessel. Don't be a dirty vessel. And don't be a broken vessel. Be a vessel of honor, meet for the master's use. So how can you keep your vessel clean, Timothy? Flee youthful lusts. Flee the things that young people are, are um, predominantly, the sins that, that young people predominantly fall to. Not just physical immorality, but pride, selfishness, the, the, the love of strife and fighting. Flee these things. Follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace. Avoid unlearned questions. Avoid the strife. And as a servant of God, be humble and be gentle. In meekness, in humility, teach. And attempt to bring along those that will allow you to. Because God might bring repentance to their heart. So that they can be recovered out of that snare. And saved from an eternity in hell. I like... 
the ending of chapter 2. We're not going to get into chapter number 3 tonight. Chapter number 3 deals with the last days and the extreme exceeding sinfulness that occurs during the last days. We'll come to that next Wednesday night. Again, I implore you, to anybody who's listening, watching this, uh, if you have any prayer requests, please let me know. Message, send me a message on Facebook. Comment on the video. Um, my phone number's there. You can give me a call. Uh, let me know if you have any prayer requests, anything that I can help you with. Uh, Robin shared a request. Uh, she has an unspoken prayer request. to be praying for her. And as I mentioned before, Betty Roadcap was doing much better the last time that I spoke with her. But if you have any requests, um, uh, please share them with me so that I can share them with you, the church. Continue to pray for the Snyders. They're still holed up in Australia. They haven't been able to make it one way or the other. One way or the other. Uh, I think they're just going to wait it out to be able to make it back home uh, to Papua New Guinea uh, as soon as the borders open back up. So be praying for the Snyders um, because I know uh, that uh, they would like to be able to get back to doing what the Lord's called them to do there in Papua New Guinea. Also, I want to ask you this. Please share this video. Uh, I'll post it on the church Facebook page. I post it on YouTube, and then I'll personally share it myself as well. Why don't you do the same thing? When you see the video or when you see it pop up that there's going to be a video soon, uh, tonight, for example, um, will you share that uh, so that others are able to study through the Word of God with us? And who knows what kind of fruits that our labors during this time are going to produce? Um, so I would just encourage you as a church to be able to do that. And to also not be afraid to share the gospel with your neighbors, the friends, the people that you still do have the opportunity to see. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I do thank you for this opportunity to be gathered together this evening. And I thank you for these folks. Lord, I ask that you would help us tonight as we go to bed, as we sleep, as we ponder about things that are coming up this week for us. I pray that you would help our church members to be good testimonies and witnesses to you. Lord, I pray for the folks who may be unsaved that are watching these videos. Lord, I pray that you would work in their hearts concerning their salvation as well. Lord, for those that uh, don't know what church they want to attend, Lord, when we have the opportunity to open these doors back up once more, I pray that uh, you would help us to, be, to see the increased influence and testimony that we've been able to have in our area. And Lord, I ask as well that you would just put your hand of blessing upon uh, the remainder of this week for us. I pray that you would keep us safe and healthy, that you protect our people, Lord, from getting this illness, and that you would um, help us, if we do get any illness, to be able to overcome it. And Lord, I ask for your hand of blessing upon us, and we ask all this in your Son's name I pray. Amen.